Welcome back everyone to the Shock Absorber podcast and it is, as always, wonderful to have you along with us whether you're watching on YouTube or you're uh, view, not viewing, listening on our podcast app, a podcast app, not out, we don't have one of those. Tim and Stu, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> thank you. You know how I always comment I mean, on. I just welcomed you back. I mean, thank, thank you. you. Welcome. 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 Welcome, Joe. <laughs> it's, it's great to have you here. <laughs> I was just, you know how I always comment on people's clothes. Yes. I realised today across the staff team that all... Every single person is wearing a black or dark grey shirt, except for me. I'm wearing a pink one. There you go. <laughs> it's rather, it's rather large Always contrast. It is a contrast. It's not you know, a shirt, though. Thank you. Well, it's actually it the, uh, it's the uh, Saw Revolve 30th anniversary shirt. Oh, is it? Yes. There you go. That we made for our 30th anniversary last year, last October. It's good. And we did the celebration. Yes. Yeah. Wow. It's like a year ago already. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. Yes, too. Mm. Wild. We still have the remnants of that, that day. Do. Behind, mm. behind you guys. Yeah, we do. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> yeah, pink pink shirt with a sea of black. You should roast me for my clothes. You know, I always talk about what you're wearing. You should say, what's wrong with your shirt? Hey, why Joel, can't, why what's can't wrong you with wear, your shirt? Why can't you wear black like the rest of us? Why can't you wear black like the rest of us? <laughs> Thanks for repeating. <laughs> How are you guys? Yeah, good, man. Going well? Yeah, really, really good. good. Excellent. Uh, we sat down as we were about to record and then we said, well... Has anyone thought of anything we should talk about? <laughs> and we said no, but then we figured it out. And today, Tim, you took the lead on this, so I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> it gives me a lot more autonomy than um, I think I had in that discussion, but it's okay. Um, yeah, well, the a cultural artifact. Um, uh, you should ask me about a cultural artifact, Joel. Do you have a cultural artifact, Tim? Oh, yes, I do have a cultural <laughs> artifact. Thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> There's... Um, the, there's a, a show that um, I often reference in my intergenerational classes called Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds, mm. uh, which is on ABC. I'm not sure if you can still get it on iView. Um, but it, basically there was this experiment in Australia to bring, integrate a preschool class into a old folks' home. And they were wondering, they hypothesised that it would bring benefits to both generations and so they did a whole lot of particularly for the uh, crew in the retirement home they did a whole lot of tests of their uh, well-being about their depression symptoms about their strength and uh, physical symptoms their mental health all of these kinds of things and then they ran this experiment where they brought the preschoolers in uh, in regular intervals and they did activities with the preschoolers and took them out on adventures and all these kinds of things mm. and tested and saw what the results were and they were fairly confident that it would have a significant benefit on their mental health and they saw that, that um, the old people in the home had a lot more positivity about their life, about their futures, about their um, way that they were able to impact into other people's lives as well. Uh, and they saw um, the, the joy of the young people coming in and they saw some, some benefit there as well. One of the surprising things, certainly to, to me, but I think to, if I remember correctly, some of the researchers as well, was there were even improvements on physical things. So people's, some of the retirees, their grip strength got stronger. Mm. Their um, ability to walk the distances they could walk were further. Like they were receiving physical benefits simply because they were being put in proximity, intentional proximity with uh, young kids, with, with preschoolers. And then the most recent series, they've done the same experiment with teenagers. I haven't watched um, that series at all, so I'm not quite sure, but I assume you get very similar benefits as well. Um, and the, the the old folk probably grow in their ability of kick flipping and, <laughs> and slam dunking. Yeah, I think that's right. Slam dunking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what if the they're hanging out with um, your, your teenagers group. from the eighties. <laughs> no, <we'll, laughs> okay, I'll show my age. But I thought I, I was just making an observation that. Um, proximity with certain age groups may bring certain skill benefits. It might do, yeah. That's all. Yep. I'll have to watch the show to see if any slam dunking gets done. They at least wear their hats on backwards. <laughs> it sounds like, it's like, like slam dunking isn't a sport thing. It's just like, you know, anyone can do it. That's the point. Like, it's funny. Yeah. Like oh, no, I yeah. can't slam dunk, and I'm 55. Yeah. Uh, anyway. No, no, you're right. It was ironic. It was irony. I remember I could almost dunk on uh, the basketball uh, ring at 
school, but it wasn't. It's not a proper high, proper full height right. yeah, basketball yeah. ring. I couldn't get the ball over the ring. Yeah, there you go. It's difficult. So there you go. Uh, let's go back to you, Tim. <laughs> yeah, well, you've reminded me of a, a Guinness World Record. Oh, um, oh. Yeah, do you know... I uh, love Guinness World the, Records. The Guinness World Record for the number of slam dunks done in 30 <laughs> seconds by a guinea pig? <laughs> <laughs> what? What is it? What is the number? Well, have a guess. What number do you think? How many, how many slam three, dunks three. do you think a guinea pig can do in 30 ten. seconds? Three. Three. I'll go 10. Right, it's it's four. Wow. Oh, it's yeah. four. You're very close. Oh, close. She, yeah. was the, she was the winner. Well yeah. done. That's one of my favourite fun facts. That, right. um, yeah. Related to what you were saying. Yeah, um, slam dunks, guinea pigs, children. Yeah, children. Yes. Uh, I, uh, last night, actually, my wife was watching a, a documentary called, it's about, on Netflix, about blue zones, which is areas of the world where people live a lot longer. Oh, right. Okay. And uh, one of them is in... Japan, but another yes. one they were looking at was studies that they'd done in Singapore about families living together. And because Singapore is a lot of high-rise living, they uh, a lot of uh, grandparents live with their children and then also their grandchildren once they once their children have children. Mm. But interestingly, Singapore have apparently brought out a law or a, like a planning rule that if you if grandparents or their children move into a certain area within a certain distance between each other, they will actually give um, incentives to buy in those areas, yeah, right. to buy property in those areas. I thought that oh. was a really fascinating thing to think about. So intentionally trying to keep family units yeah. together and, and different genera- the multi-generational That's right, households together. They see the benefits of what you're talking about from the uh, old people's home for four-year-olds. Yes. It's just exactly the same thing of keeping families together. And uh, I can't remember what they actually said, but it was like uh, they interviewed one of the grandfathers and he was maybe uh, – 85 and he's like i love it i love being able to look after the kids and and do things like that and then they also n- talked about a a singaporean man who was a doctor but he was 92 years old and still practicing right really wow. yeah so they were saying what that that charger. was one of the things that helped because he lives with his family and, and helps him keep him vibrant yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah we, i mean we had my <laughs> grandmother live with us three days a week for most of my sort of upper primary high school years because my mum went back to work but mum was really keen for there to be an adult around who can welcome us home and mm. make us afternoon tea and help us homework and so her mum um, came and lived and we had uh, there was a roll out bed um, in my room and so you know I shared a room with grandma for you yeah. know a three days I think it was you know two nights three days mm. a week for a lot of my growing up and yeah it was really lovely just to have the three generations together and Dinner together regularly and those kinds of things. Yeah. Looking back on that now, can you see uh, like an impact that it's had on just how you are as a person? Do you think? Yeah, it's one of those. I mean, what was what's the opposite? Like, I mean, I, I didn't have the opposite, so it's hard to compare exactly. Yeah. Like, have I got benefits now that I don't realise? Uh, perhaps. Yeah. Um, it was also she was the my only living grandparent uh, that I've ever had uh-huh. as well. So there was something special and unique about yep. that relationship because she was the only grandparent. Um, which was uh, you know, lovely uh, mm. f- for for her and for us as a family uh, to have her around and have her present. Mm. Mm. It's almost uh, stu- like you've talked about this before, though. It's like recapturing the village mm. vibe, isn't it? Of you know, there's that saying: it takes a village to raise a child, mm. kind of thing. But that comes out of pre-industrial. Uh, I was going to say revolution. Yeah, in revolution. Yeah, I almost industrial. said revelation. The, yeah. <laughs> the industrial revolution, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I, I think that's a good point, Joel. Like, it's the industrial revolution that has uh, changed the way we live because pre-industrial societies tend to have fairly stable communities, often established in agrarian areas and agrarian cultures. Uh, the home is a lot more integrated than it is in a industrialised home. Uh we kind of professionalise a lot of things in our day and age that would have just been uh, done by the family unit. So it's even interesting, the whole debate we had about uh, that, that has started in the, you know, in, the, in the 60s and to this day really about the roles of men and women um, working. Um, there's always been, in pre-industrial societies, there was always occupations for men and women. So women worked in the home in cottage industries and men worked in the home in cottage industries so mm-hmm. weavers for example was a really prominent female occupation and the industrial revolution actually um, transformed their 
uh, industry because weavers all over Great Britain, when, when the, the big factories opened up and they started weaving mass-produced garments, then the weavers right across England actually rose up and had demonstrations in Manchester particularly, which is named after the production of Manchester products. Mm -hmm. um, that city is where the early Luddite mm. revolutions took place and the early Luddite revolutions were farm workers who were revolting against the introduction of technology that replaced their cottage industries. And so in Manchester, in the, in the riots there, there was a majority of women who were rioting because it was the, the women who were rising up saying, you're taking our jobs off us by starting these big factories. It's making mass... We can't make clothes as cheaply and as quickly as you can make them. So they were putting out uh, of work lots of women. So um, by the 1950s, I think there's a stereotype that men work and women stay in the home and look after kids, I think, by the 1950s. But I think that was predominantly a post-industrial uh, nuclear family invention mm. that our society created mm. out of the Industrial Revolution rather than the way people have lived for millennia. I mean, if you look in traditional societies today, you still see men and women with different occupations working together in the family and the children worked in the occupations as well. And uh, that's why you also have a great deal of... Uh, problems when the industrial revolution starts because not only did the men go to the factories but the men the women and the children all went to the factories when the jobs dried up in the countryside uh, people migrated from the villages to the cities and where once 75 percent of the population lived in the countryside now 75 percent live in the cities so you get this problem of child labor for example because in the victorian consciousness it actually was common sense that children would pa take part in the production of whatever so they had eight-year-olds who developed stoop backs from standing in front of machines all day because mm -hmm. they were the same little girls that would have been sitting with their mother weaving at, yeah. a, at a loom in the house so yeah this idea of um the intergenerational aspect in a village being lost i think was lost progressively you get a situation where uh in the post-industrial context the generations needed each other by economic necessity. So mm -hmm. young people had the strength and the older people had the wisdom. Yep. So the older people would tell the younger people when to plant and where to plant. So there's a respect for old knowledge. So in pre-industrial societies, old knowledge was more economically valuable than new knowledge. And that's why when new things came along, there was a lot of um, suspicion ideas. Oh, what someone could come up with a new idea. Uh, after the Industrial Revolution, it, it reverses because technology is what the young people understand. So now new knowledge is more valuable than old knowledge and young people don't need old people through economic necessity anymore. So what you see, I think, over the next 200 years is a slow breakdown of community, first from the village to the extended family living in the slums in the cities. And this isn't just in England, it's right across all the different industrialising societies in Europe and America and everywhere the Industrial Revolution's gone since, across to Asia and down to Africa. But when you see an inter a big migration to the cities, you see a breakdown from the village to the extended family. And, uh, you know, my grandmother grew up in the 20s and 30s in England. And even in England in the 20s and 30s, about 120 years after the Industrial Revolution, there was still the extended family. Everybody lived near each other, like mm -hmm. you're describing. The Singaporean government's trying to encourage. Yeah. And that's because no one had motor cars. But then after the Second World War and the invention of motor cars, people migrated out of the city centres and again. went out again and went into the suburban context. And now you have the nuclear family, mum and dad and the two kids uh, stereotype. And in that context, dad's going to work, mum stays home, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, occupations had been created by the Industrial Revolution and women, since the suffragettes, were fighting for equal rights to the vote and equal pay and things. But there was this hangover of, well, the man is kind of earning money for the family and if a woman takes a man's job, there was this old-fashioned idea that was wrong that a woman would be taking a family's uh, income because the man was working for the family. So there was a lot of really difficult things to navigate and the feminist movement moved society through a lot of those kind of debates quite extensively but yeah if you look back to how work was i think there was a lot more men and women working i mean the fields is another example men and women were in the fields mm. cleaning the fields it wasn't just men it was children would have been helping children would have been helping yeah. yeah so there you see all the generations and the sexes actually working together yeah. and so that we're all torn apart and given these professionalised labels in the Industrial Revolution. And so now you've got a situation where 
you know, early on the kids and the women were in the factories, but over time they thought that was bad for the kids and the women, so then the women and the kids weren't working in the factories. But then by the sec- Second World War, when all the war generation went overseas to fight, then they needed the women back in the factories yeah. again. So there's yeah. all this toing and froing because yeah. of technology. And so what we're left with is post-suburban lifestyle. We've now got the fastest growing households in Australia, at least, are people living alone. So there's this big loneliness epidemic because yeah. now you've got technology replacing people in your life. So once upon a time, the kids needed the old people, now they don't. Uh, and then the technology even replaces other people. I don't need other people. I can just live by myself and actually make it by myself now when that would have been economically unsustainable in the pre-industrial world. But talking about that old needing young thing, my uncle was a panel beater in the 80s, 70s and 80s, and by the 2000s he'd become a TAFE teacher and he decided to quit and he said to me one day, oh, I've, I've quit, you know, I've retired early basically, he said. I said, why is that Uncle John? And he said, well, all the all the kids are coming into the classes telling me about what the latest technology is in the panel beating workshops on the ground they know more about panel beating than i do now and i thought what am i doing bothering teaching them about panel beating i'm talking about what you used to do with a hammer and you know hammer out the the stuff on a car or whatever so i think i think you've got this really interesting problem for us in society where we don't need each other economically but i think the different ages need each other relationally and i think Mm. there's a beautiful spiritual component to it as well and i think the church can actually lead in that space where we can actually we are a, a body of Christ and we're a family. You know, Paul talks about us being a family and we're all brothers and sisters. So we've got an opportunity in the church to actually reconnect those things that have been lost in the, inter, in, in the Industrial Revolution years, I think. Mm, I think that's really interesting, isn't it? That it's almost like, as you're saying, the Industrial Revolution has like kind of re- caused it to reform. So we're looking for different ways to reform that, like the... Mm the Singaporean government, for example, doing that, the idea even of old people's home. Mm. How does the, how do you think the, and again, like, cause we actually do try and capture this to a certain degree at church. How does, I'll go with you first, Tim. How do, how do you think we try and do recapture that in a way that is also honoring God and also honoring like our other brother and sis, brothers and sisters at church? Yeah, well, I think it's worth saying we haven't always, and this is what we've talked about a lot on this podcast and I talk a lot in my intergenerational class is that um, because of, uh, so we, we have these dislocations of family units, mm. we have the dislocations of generations and then particularly in the post-war baby boomers, we then get um, even further uh, dislocation of generations as the those baby boomers, boomers become teenagers and we've talked a lot about that and Stu's you know, done a lot of work in the, the history and sociology of the, the 50s and 60s and what mm-hmm. happens when those that baby boomer generation comes of age and the rock and roll and all of those kinds of yeah. things that come out of that. Um, but the other thing that's coming along uh, parallel to this is educational theory. And so there's a lot of really ed- great educational theory that's coming out here talking about how different people at different ages learn um, at different stages. And so um, Piaget is kind of the, the gold standard here and he was doing his work in Switzerland. Um, and so he worked from the, I mean, he was born 1920 you know, something. Um, so he's doing his work from the sort of the forties onwards. And he is uh, looking at what each stage, age and stage of children are capable of. And he says, what you need to do is you need to teach them at the age and stage of their capable of so you've got these different things coming together you've got the this i suppose the sociology of dislocating families uh dislocating well you've dislocated the workplace from the home so that's the first thing that's yep. happened um and which was that removal of the cottage industry into the the factories and we've kind of like just we assume that now um yeah, there's been a bit of a turnaround with recently with the COVID and yeah. work from home <laughs> kind of thing and, and technology may help some of that Maybe a little bit reverse, perhaps. It'd be good to talk about that in another podcast. Yeah, that'd be a really interesting thing. Yeah, I'm interested in your ideas about keep that. Keep writing on that. That'd be right. Um, but we've, we, so we've dislocated work from the home. Um, we've dislocated the generations from each other. And things like child labour laws, which prevent children from being in the, um, the place of uh, economic prosperity, like economic building, like, you know, Parents or adults are out there doing the economic work of a society. Mm. Children are not allowed in those spaces. So what do you do? Well, you end up 
um, having almost reactionary to create schools. So you need to create communities where children can actually hang out. And so the whole schooling movement, public schooling movement, that's happening through the 1800s particularly. Uh, you're building up uh, schools and then you've got Piaget and other theorists coming along saying the best way to do schooling is to segregate the ages as best as possible. So really early schools would have just had all ages in together and let's all just do this. Whether you're five or 15, you're just kind of all in the same classroom. Um, but you start the, the best way to do education through a Piaget framework is to split off the ages because then you can teach the five-year-olds as five-year-olds, six-year-olds as six-year-olds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, the, where it comes into the church is what we've talked about in terms of you end up with specialised youth ministry and particularly as a reaction to uh, the Jesus movement. And again, we've talked heaps about that. People can go back and find lots of conversation about that on mm. the podcast. Um, so youth ministry becomes specialised in the 70s um, or it has already had expressions at different times but really gets um, uh, supercharged during the late 60s and 70s as the Jesus uh, movement is coming along and uh, they're not being welcomed with their long hair and uh, bare, feet. bare feet into the <laughs> into the church of their uh, parents generation and uh, the Jesus Revolution movie shows that really really clearly um, and then you also uh, probably with about a 20 year drag you start to get the professionalization of children's ministry as well um, that had always been there with you know Sunday school movements and sort of things like that and so you end up, particularly by the 90s, early 2000s, um, your gold standard church is one that is able to segregate the ages as much as possible so that you can teach at developmentally appropriate stages, um, which means you end up with children's ministry wings, you end up with youth ministry wings. Uh, you then get the bulk of people that are sort of 20 to 60 um, are in the main building, um, and by the the, the 90s and into the 2000s, you've got the, the baby boomers and the emerging Gen Xs uh, making up the bulk of that sort of middle adulthood between young adult and retiree. And then you've got the, um, the greatest generation uh, who are the, the boomers' parents uh, and for a number of different reasons they are often in their own little service um, because you know, they wanted their hymns, their prayer books, et cetera, et cetera. So they've got their own little thing. And so what you end up with in the church um, by, again, the sort of, Late 90s, the gold standard church is you've got a prayer book service so that um, all of your greatest generation can worship in the way that is relevant to them. Uh, you've got evening services where the youngest, um, the, the, the teenagers and young adults uh, can worship in a way that's relevant to them. And then you've got a family service where a lot of the boomers and their children, who are the millennials, um, are able to do children's ministry and age segregated services. And so this becomes, like, if you can afford a church and the staffing team to do that, you're doing really well. And if you're not there yet, you aspire to be something like that. Um, and so what we're seeing uh, now culturally, um, well, yeah, sorry, the result of that was you end up with dislocated children and teenagers who are sort of separate from the main body where they've seen the main action is happening. And you've also got your senior saints, uh, the greatest generation, who are in their service uh, somewhere else um, and they're also not connected to the main action of the church the main action of the church is where those middle adults are hanging out and so we sort of uh, specialized and created a a gold standard version of church which separated the ages as much as possible um, and so that's what the sort of the intergenerational movement now is largely reacting against and saying oh actually they're what were the benefits of that? There were certain benefits in terms of, yes, there are developmental benefits for children who can uh, learn the language of faith and express the language of faith in, um, in age-appropriate ways. Uh, there is the whole um, homogeneous unit principle was a theory that said people want to hang out with people who are like themselves. So if you can create different multiple gatherings where people can hang out with people who are just like themselves, they will grow faster. Um, generally speaking, and so that was seen as a win. We should do that because it's great to grow churches as fast as possible. That's reaching the kingdom. Um, that's making more disciples of Christ. But then we would increasingly note, when I say we, the larger church, the academy, people looking into these things, were noticing that there were some uh, great deficits as well. 
um, and there were things like a whole lot of teenagers dropping out of church because they never felt they were a part of it anyway. They were over there in the youth ministry wing. They weren't part of the main action. And all of a sudden you say, okay, you graduated from youth group. You're not welcome at youth group anymore. Now go and hang out with these people that you barely know um, and you've never really had any interaction with and that's your new home. Oh, and by the way, all of the language, expression of faith, uh, words of the sermon, etc., etc., are largely geared towards um, a generation and two generations older than you. So it won't really be relevant for you, but that's where you put up with that until you're 40 and then you'll feel like it's home. And so many teenagers just said, well, I'm not putting up with that. So they left. So that was one, was youth ministry was largely fallen off. Um, and also the dislocation of ages mean people didn't feel connected and we miss the benefit of actually speaking into each other's lives. And that's where it's really fascinating what you say about the show that Karen was watching, mm. that those who are in intergenerational relationships uh, are actually living longer. They've got yeah. healthier statistics and they've got all these things. And you go, oh, that's really interesting. Like the church has an opportunity and particularly in Western society, uh, it's one of the last opportunities where it's possible to actually have different generations gathering together. And I guess the question, the, the big question I want to leave my class with at the end of every year, we've talked about in generational ministry for 26 weeks, and I want to leave them with, uh, is that something that excites you? And is that something you want to you know, be a part of making a change for? Um, so that trying to create lots of opportunities and spaces where all the generations can hang out, where the, the preschoolers can hang out with the seniors, who can hang out with the boomers, who can hang out with the Xs, who can hang out with the millennials, and um, where because it's actually not the generations that define us, it's Jesus, and because we've all got Jesus in common, then we can create spaces where these kind of relationships can happen. Mm, yeah. I think it, you, you spoke about that Blue Zones documentary, so the, there's apparently five Blue Zones in the world, and what sets them apart is the obviously the the age that people live to so the five blue zones are the okinawa prefecture in japan neuro province in sardinia in italy the nicoya peninsula in costa rica icaria icaria in greece and loma linda in california but apparently in the sardinian um, location that is the highest concentration of male centenarians in the world Wow. So there's so many people over the age of 100. It mm. makes a big difference. But I was also looking at Old People's Home for four-year-olds, Tim. It is available on iView. Oh, great. But, um, Stu, I thought what was interesting, though, you know how on a lot of streaming platforms or anything, they have um, kind of categories down below. And I just wanted to read them out. I thought it might be interesting to see how you react to this. Stay connected. That makes sense. Play groups, because we've got four-year-olds. Resources intergenerational education and ageless friendships. Ageless friendships. I thought that was pretty cool. I like cool. that. Mm. I like that. I think we might start using that. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what we're trying to pull off, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, how, how do we pull that off, though? I don't know. Well, <laughs> it's, it, well it's, uh, it's funny when I was listening to you, Tim, say that the 90s, the gold standard of church was the homogeneous unit principle. It's probably why we got a bit of pushback in the 90s when we were trying to start intergenerational relationships in ministry at our local church at Gomer Anglican. Uh, in the 90s so I suppose it wasn't uh, common sense it wasn't uh, intuitive for people to think about getting everyone together and in fact some people used to say oh it's messy and it's not going to work if you get everyone to get together but we we had I think I've said this before on the podcast but we had this fantastic night where we asked a retired doctor to come along and give us a a talk on uh, sexuality and he basically came and shared his view and we used to I think it was terrific to have our elders come along and give talks, but man, when he gave that talk on his his opinions on sexuality from a doctor's point of view is very clinical. <laughs> and I think uh, the rates of sexual immorality went through the floor for at least six months, I think, <laughs> after that talk. That was pretty cool. But that just, everyone thought it was terrific and we were, we were all just like in awe of his wisdom and his ability to speak with authority and passionate pastoral skill at the same time mm. uh but yeah i think experimenting is good um talking about the japanese experiments uh there's there's also there's also an article i found on vice magazine about uh japanese attempts to try and reconnect their elders with their kids because as you said the society's changed in their country as well mm. and they've got this idea called yoro and i'm sorry if i don't pronounce this correctly yoro shizet su i think it is but we'll have to see what. What do you? How do you reckon that's pronounced? Yoro Shizetsu. 
Yeah, okay, there you go. So with my terrible Australian accent, I've got <laughs> close phonetically maybe, if not in accent. But yeah, this is what the article says. It says, not so long ago, the norm in Japanese society was for the husband to work and the mother to stay at home and take care of the children. After retirement, should the couple become too old to care for themselves, they would generally move in with their youngest son, whose wife would take the responsibility of looking after them long, along with their own children. But these days, families are getting smaller and more and more mothers are working outside the home. As such, the numbers of both seniors, centres and daycare providers are on the rise. Uh, but rather than keep the two groups separate, some facilities are giving them the opportunities to mingle in something called Yoro Shizetsu institutions where the very young and the elderly interact and share experiences that let both of them see that the beauty of life has neither minimum age nor an expiry date i think that's really lovely mm. so in some contexts apparently they're even building uh blocks of units for uh people who are retired to live in and underneath there's a daycare center right. so that they can actually uh bring the the in safe ways, bring the volunteers in and be a part of the daycare centre as well. So that it gives the generations an opportunity to mix, which is pretty exciting as well. So, yeah, I think there's lots of experiments around. I think in the church, uh, starting conversation is good to say, how can we listen to each other? Hence the whole shock absorber idea, which is what happens if young people and old people actually talk to each other and become friends in that? What did, what did they call it on the ABC? Oh, ageless friendships. Ageless friendships. I mm. think that's fantastic. Mm. So the idea is that... Uh, the outcomes of having churches so so the problem is people come to church looking for something that they can connect with and over many generations now or well three not many three generations we've been kind of training christians to get used to finding a church service that suits them in their age group mm. so i think it's helpful to just have a conversation about it in the first instance because people come to church and say oh this isn't really for me I hear that phrase a lot and that means, oh, this is not what I'm looking for. This is for someone else. I'm going to go to a service that is for me, which is generally I like the music, the the talks are actually feeding me. Uh, I'm with a lot of people my age yeah. and I'm getting friends with people my age. I think that's generally what people are looking for when they say that. Add to that it might be, oh, and my children need to be looked after well, my teenagers do. There needs to be a women's group and a men's group. It's a bit of a consumeristic and an individualistic stance, which I think is really difficult to... To challenge because people can get offended easily and feel like you're rebuking them if you encourage them that there's other ways of seeing church so to say well if you think of it more communally and come with a servant heartedness you might have even more fun <laughs> to not that you're only doing those things to have more fun but church can actually be really meaningful and deep when you actually do have ageless friendships so i think we've got to find new top new names for things like that like re re kind of invent the way we do church a bit and share the stories i think people learn by experiencing as well but if they haven't experienced it yet the stories of how other people have done stuff i think that helps as well i think i think of your parents Stu. Uh, yep i mean how i mean i'm not best friends with them but i have a relationship with them and the, every time i see your mum she gives me a hug mm. for example <laughs> and that's really special to know that i love the the uh the energy that they bring even though they are reasonably old. Late 70s, yeah. yeah. So they bring a lot of energy. Just about 80, yeah. yeah. And I think that makes a big difference to us younger people in the congregation that like, oh, they're still charging on. We want to, I want to be like them when I'm their age. I think that's a big part of it. You get role models and you see your future. Mm. So if yeah. teenagers see young adults, they see a Christian version of themselves living a godly life as a young adult. They don't have to work it out for themselves. And then if they see, you know, people different age groups going through different things, I mean... For someone, I mean, we had a very powerful moment at a week away uh, this year, our church camp that we go on, and we have all the generations come together. There's 250 of us go away for a family holiday together, actually. And uh, a couple had just lost a baby, and part of the interview in the mm. service one morning was they just shared a bit of their story uh, very beautifully and powerfully about how they were trusting God through a very difficult time. Mm. And I was just thinking how profound that there's a lot of teenagers and young adults here listening to that story yes who've been introduced to the idea of miscarriage. And they're, they've probably got no friends who, they may have had a, a friend with a teenage pregnancy, but uh, it's fairly uh, rare for that to happen in our area of Sydney. And so the ideas of losing a baby probably have never occurred to some of the, mm. the people there. So to see a couple that are struggling with it, but getting through it and go, oh, well, they got through it. And 
I think there's a real help there. It's the, uh, a friend of mine too, who's a counselor, once said that he thinks soul revival is a really great suicide prevention program. And oh, I said, wow. what did, "That's a big call." What did you mean by that? He said, "Well, young people who are going through hard times that might be going through really difficult, uh, dark thoughts." Uh, in friendship and relationship with people who are just a bit older and they see their future and that can actually he was saying i don't know enough about the research but he was saying his as he researched things like that that intergenerational communities can actually reduce depression and anxiety and reduce uh, risks of harm to certain young people uh, not as a silver bullet obviously but as um, a strategy that can actually help people to say well i'm going through a hard time now but maybe yeah maybe my life might turn out like that down the track so if you're only surrounded by people your own age the future is a bit of a black hole you don't know what to expect but if you see it played out in front of you week to week in church then i think you can with a great deal of confidence say okay i kind of don't have to worry what it's going to look like i might worry about what ha- is before me or what's happening now but mm. that's a really cool thing too mm-hmm. but also the, the the support from different generations like you mm-hmm. said your mum my mum's not your best friend but she's there as a friend she's a friend and if you need her she's there for you yeah Yeah, that's right yeah you're gonna say something yeah i was just thinking uh, um, in terms of suicide prevention i was thinking about that connection with our senior saints as well um, because there's a lot of data now about the increasing rate of suicide amongst seniors in our society oh really Uh, and so i just done a a quick little google um but the the australian bureau of statistics in 2021 males aged over 85 years had the highest suicide rate of all groups wow um uh, 30 36.4 deaths for 100,000 um the suicide rate for all males of all ages was 18.2 so 36.4 compared to 18.2 per 100,000 people. Um, and so, again, part of that is the, the lack of um, autonomy, the lack of agency that often happens in the, in, with our seniors. And particularly... Lonely, loneliness if, too, maybe? Well, that's, yeah, so that, the loneliness Sorry, as well. Sorry, I jumped in. Yeah. No, no, that's right. So loneliness, um, even simple things like lack of physical touch, so the fact that you know you, when we see your mum, she gives us a big hug. Yeah. She's also yeah. receiving mm-hmm. there yeah. uh, physical touch in mm-hmm. ways that many seniors who may have, um, if they're living alone, if they're even if they're living in a um, an older couple living alone or in a retirement village, they may not get a lot of physical touch that's affectionate. That's not just mm. you know the nurse helping out with something um, medical, but is actually just the, the physical part of actually being around people. So there's a whole lot of things, and again, so in terms of we, we often think about youth suicide as a um, a particular thing that churches can help with, and absolutely that's really really key. But the amount of agency and value that we can give our seniors as well, because again they're the age group which are often because of a whole lot of loss of things that they have had, um, increasing their risk of suicide as well. And so creating communities where they are known and loved and valued and, and partaking in genuine life together um, is amazing and a huge thing. And it, it's right there for churches to do um, if we don't prioritise this, uh, you know, splitting people off homogenous units is the best way to grow churches. Well, no, actually spiritually formative work and as we can see the sort of a whole person anthropology of how god has made us to be Mm. is actually we god has designed us to be intergenerational disciples uh and so we we see this the faith impact of that but we also see in some of these things just the the physical the mental the relational impact of that as well because that's how god has made Mm. us to be and so yeah, where western society has sort of atomized the individual Mm. um it's it's ended up creating a society where we are less than human we, we have we have dehumanized we have the god has actually made us to be well it's almost like the industrial revolution is like we're becoming machines so it's like you plug in for this for this age group that's where you go and mm. yeah and you're useful for a particular time um i call it yeah, thomas okay. the tank, tank engine view of humans because <laughs> yeah thomas is always praised for being a very useful engine um and we have that view of humans uh children are not useful yet because they can't contribute to our gdp mm. um retirees are no longer useful 
because they don't contribute to our GDP. Um, it's that middle bracket between 18 and 65 that are important and significant because they can contribute to our GDP. We have, like, it's this economic mindset. And we can fall into the same trap in the, like, where we ask people to do things at church. You know, what service roles do we provide for children? How do they have genuine agency and uh, speak up into Places. I mean, you, you shared a story about your daughter praying. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Now, she's probably not going to lead prayer to the church, but is she given space in the faith community to be praying and to be praying in the presence of others who will be you know, benefiting from that? I know that you know, Stu's mum, Bev, would love it if she sat, was sitting with Remy while Remy prayed. <laughs> like, how cool would that be? Yeah. Like, how encouraging that would be? Yeah. Um, and likewise, uh, our, our seniors, saints, what roles are they giving? Are they giving agency, value, um, and not because they're only valuable if they're useful, but because we just love them and we want them to have a space where they can genuinely contribute to their ability within the service. So I've got an idea. Oh, excellent. Off the top of my head. Okay, let's go. So this Vice article said that the interaction between the old and young in their homes is a two-way street, of course. So it's not just the seniors who come to visit the children. On other days, the little tykes stop by to spend time with the elderly re residents in their half of the building. Okay. And while the two groups get together regularly, the Institute also plans a number of joint special events, uh, often coinciding with traditional Japanese holidays, such as Children's Day uh, and some other days. Once a year, everyone goes off on an overnight summer camp trip to the beach together. Oh, that's, cool. that's so unreal. <laughs> Aside from helping the elderly find a sense of purpose in their daily routine, the arrangement also has a positive effect on the children, helping them to imbue them with a sense of community as well as a respect and a consideration for the elderly. Cool. So the thought that occurred to me was one of the problems we have in our churches is it's all well and good to say it's good to get the children and the elderly together, but in some churches we don't have a lot of ch children and we don't have a lot of youth. What if churches that did have a lot of youth and children did become friends with churches that didn't have a lot of children and youth so that they could interact with each other. So, yep. for example, a church like Soul Revival that doesn't have a lot of elderly people in it yet, what if we were friends with a church that did have a lot of elderly and we organised some combined events mm. and we said to our youth group, this Friday night we're actually going to go and hang out for a fellowship tea with the church down the road and we're going to just hang out. Yep. Not for any other purpose other than to get to know each other and supper, have an opportunity to have a pray together and a sing together maybe, learn a few different songs from each other or whatever it might be. So I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but it just popped into my head. I'm just sort of thinking that's something we could do mm. because there are churches that have youth and kids. Um, and if there was like a small cluster of churches that wanted to get together, then there could be groups from each of those churches that could come to an event, not a youth event or a kids event, or a men's event or a women's event, what if it was an intergenerational event for all the churches to come together so that people could st share some stories about what it's like being a Christian at their age and mm. they could talk about uh, their different um, heritages if people come from different migrant backgrounds. I think that would be really quite lovely. So this is the original, like kind of the original idea of the Relo Bash, which you did within Guy Church, yeah, but you're yeah. expanding it yeah, to other churches. Yeah, I just thought, thought about it then. Yep. Why not have a Relo Bash with other churches? Yeah, well. That's pretty cool. Mm, I don't know what, to, what you think about that. How are we going to make that happen? I don't know. <laughs> that's the next question. I, li um, I like the idea. I'm going to think about that. Yeah. Mm. That's really cool. Um, to bring the Blue Zones documentary back in, it also said in terms of uh, people that older people, because they obviously the Blue Zones are saying there's a lot of old people there, um, they have things to do, including like a community garden that they all tend to together but what ha happens is they all spend time with each other in community and talking to each other but the other thing that they said in the documentary and i'm sorry to keep bringing it up but i thought it was really fascinating i always saw the last 15 minutes of when my wife was watching it last night but it was um they don't have a huge culture of physical activity in terms of you go to the gym all the time if that makes sense but they're always moving so they're always there's right. hills around there's areas where it's not just focused on uh, the road isn't the primary way of getting around. It's actually walking. And there's, a, there's an architect by the name of Jan Gell who I've seen around a couple of times and he actually was, had a big hand in changing how Melbourne uh, operated in terms of how people got around the city. Because I don't know if you know, I mean, if you've been to Melbourne, Melbourne's quite an easy 
town or city to get around, in my opinion. So he also came to Sydney and said the problem with the Sydney CBD, after studying it for a number of months, is that it's too focused on – it prioritises cars over people. So people can't get around as much as possible. And now if you look at the area around Darling Harbour, you can actually walk from uh, Town Hall or even Wynyard Station – all the way to Darling Harbour and hardly have to go anywhere near a road, which I think is fantastic. But that's part of the, the um, changes that he's implemented. So I think that's really interesting as a, as a way of how do we create environments, like you're talking about, Stu, for those, for those things to happen. So my next question, I suppose, and to throw this back to Tim, is that let's, take the, let's go all the way back to the other side of the age spectrum. Mm. You, uh, we've talked about your... A research article that you've had published recently, which was interesting, but also you're writing, you've started to write a book. I have, cool. yes. And you started writing on theology of children. Is yep. that right? Yep. So how do you think that, what you're writing about, plays into how we're, what we're talking about here of how can we have ageless or create ageless friendships? Yeah, well, I think when it comes to thinking about our bringing it really into the, the Christian space and the faith formation discipleship space, one of the questions you have to wrestle with is, well, are children disciples now or disciples later? Are they the church of tomorrow or the church of today? Um, and so it comes down to your theology of children. What do, you, who, what do you actually believe about children? And so part of the, the chapter I'm trying to write at the moment is just fleshing out those ideas. And I've got, I think it's nine categories at the moment, um, of theology of children um, and... I think if, depending what you believe about children within the community of the church will impact the importance you place on actually bringing them into these intergenerational relationships or not and what you think that will happen when you do those kinds of things. Mm. Um, and so uh, really quickly, uh, the nine that I've got at the moment, mm. um, so the first one is that they are, they are image bearers um, because they are, they are human and so because they're human, they share all the characteristics of Humanness. One, the first one is that they are made in the image of God, and so that tells us a whole lot of th things that are very significant um, about who children are. But they're all made in the image of God. Um, the second thing, like all humanity, they are fallen, so they um, fall short of the glory of God. And therefore, the third thing is that they are in need of and able to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. So there's a gospel solution to the problem. So that's true of all humanity, and because we believe children are human, uh, therefore, yeah, those things are all true of human. They are image bearers. Um, they're fallen and in need of grace, and um, Jesus has come to save. And so that that's true for all of humanity. Um, focusing down a little bit more, particularly about children, uh, so the they are developing, and so some of the insights of Piaget. Uh, is the, you know they are capable of different things at different times, um, and linked to that is the next one, which is there's a vulnerability attached to that, mm. and you can see this in Jesus. This is the paragraph I was writing, trying to nut out on Tuesday, but the the idea of uh, Jesus was very aware of the vulnerability of children. God has a particular heart for vulnerable people, like right throughout the. Bible, you've got this refrain of the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, or the alien, or the foreigner. Um, and so, you know, God declares that he is a God who is for vulnerable people. Um, Israel is chastised for not caring for vulnerable people. And then Jesus makes it very particular. He sort of highlights all those groups in his ministry. But in Matthew 18 and Matthew 19, he particularly talks about children. And there's a verse there that he says, it would be better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and thrown into the deepest ocean than to hurt one of these little ones. And he's particularly talking about children there mm. and so jesus has particular care for vulnerability and so the implication of that is we need to make sure of our safe ministry practices are uh, taken very seriously and one of the things when i train safe, safe ministry is i say yeah safe ministry is a theological task because we are to the impact to the extent that we are imaging god who is a god who cares for the vulnerable in the way that we care for the vulnerable we are imaging god we're, it's a theological task that we're engaged in so that's really significant and then uh, children are placed in families. There's a whole lot of verses about that, and that comes up uh, probably later in my book where I'll talk about the importance of family ministry. Um, and then the, the last kind of subsection with some points under it is children as disciples. And this is where you'll get some denominational 
uh, distinctive. So um, Baptist churches and Anglican churches will disagree on this, for example. Um, but theologically, as an Anglican church, we baptise infants because there's a theological understanding that they are part of the covenant community of God. And so it's right to give them the sign of the covenant, which is the baptism. Um, so it is right to baptise infants. It's in line with uh, the um, application of baptism in the New Testament to baptise children. Um, children are precious to Jesus as well. So as, um, Matthew 18, 19 again is really clear on that. Jesus says, let the children come to me, do not hinder them. Um, and then he also talks about how children are capable of saving faith uh, and are actually... Um, representatives of saving faith to adults. So he talks about um, the kingdom belongs to such as these. And he says, unless you become like these little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So there's a lot of ink spilled about working out what does that mean. And I'll play around with some of that in my book. Spill some more ink. Spill some more ink. (laughs) Trying to uh, make it short and sharp but relevant. Um, But uh, what that means is that particularly as an Anglican church, but uh, for for most churches, the children are seen as disciples of Jesus. They're seen as capable of saving faith. Um, you know, Remy's prayer is evidence that mm. you know, she has some sort of faith. Um, no, it's not as uh, sophisticated as an adult's faith. It's not as developed as an adult's faith. Uh, but I see nothing in the scripture that prevents me from saying it is nevertheless real faith. And so therefore, if children are capable of real faith, then putting them into these intergenerational relationships, they can impact the faith of teenagers. Children can share their faith and impact the um, the, the faith of 40-year-olds and 60-year-olds yeah. and 80-year-olds and vice versa down the chain as well. And so this is part of why I argue that you know, the church is built for intergenerational discipleship. Um, and I've particularly said in sermons before, you know, how can you expect to grow as a Christian if you don't hang out with children? Because Jesus says it right there, you know, unless you become like these, well, how do I know what they are like? How do I know what children are like unless I'm hanging out with them? So I actually think there's there's a disadvantage for those who are not in some way interacting in a safe ministry, appropriate way with children in a faith space because they're missing out on one of the ways that God has given us to grow as disciples of Jesus. Mm. It's good. Do you, oh, do you have something to add to that? Mm. I was just going to ask you in regards to that you apply your strategic mind to this. So we've kind of talked about, and one of your ideas was how can we take our, um, our youth crew to go and meet up with older people. So we kind of younger people are going up to an older age group. Mm. How do we bring older age groups down to, to younger age groups so we can mm. continue to like form those ageless friendships from an earlier age? Yeah, I think inviting um, some elders uh, to come along and, speak at a youth event like you said with the, uh, yeah, it was dr yeah. bonamy wasn't it yeah, yeah. dr bonamy was great like having uh having an opportunity in the church services to i think encourage people who can gather the different ages to do that um at our church we have the benefit of having a meal with services but people don't always go and sit with someone different so i noticed that some people have the ability in churches, whether it be over morning tea or whether it be over a dinner, to gather people together and introduce them to each other. I think that's an that's actually an undervalued ministry in our churches, people who can connect people up with other people in the church. And uh, yeah, I think I think there was a, in my generation, in the baby boomer generation, there was a lot of talk about the generation gap. And I'm really glad that generation gap conversation seems to have changed a lot. I don't hear that being spoken about these days much i remember the old hoodoo guru song called the generation gap which was a bit of an anthem so the idea was if you were young you were predisposed to disagree with your parents and elders you know you were fighting against them and in order to make the world a better place you had to actually rebel against your parents and that goes right back to rebel without a cause back in the 1950s with uh that movie that came out the idea that the older generation just don't understand us and all this kind of stuff so there's this kind of like posture i think with young people naturally they're going to want to do new things and reinvent themselves and naturally they're trying to explore who they are as distinct from the elders and i don't want to uh not recognize that but at the same time if we can actually help them to know that it's a really healthy thing to to have the adults around i mean i love it when i see schools get the grandparents have grandparents day i don't know maybe we could 
we could do something where we get uh, I know YouthWorks does stuff with mums and daughter days and dads and daughter days and dads and sons days things like that I mean I don't think we necessarily need to manufacture those things but creating some of those spaces for people to actually get to know each other so they can form friendships uh, for those of us who are trying intergenerational church spaces to just constantly speak invitation into the gathering saying you know it's actually a good thing to get to know someone who's different you might feel awkward to start off with and not know what to say but it, it's a real benefit uh, another thing we tried in the past was we had this thing called the Independent Jackhammer Workers Union <laughs> at Guy Ring Lincoln Church and that happened because I needed to get some jackhammering done at my place and I got some of the young adult blokes to come and help me jackhammer and we enjoyed it so much <laughs> that we wanted to do it again. So we made an announcement at church, does anybody need any jackhammering doing? <laughs> and we'll come around, you, you hire the gear and we'll get into it and jackhammer your rock for you. And so we had a few people take us up on it and I had this group of guys and one of the boys goes, oh, his name was Shaney. He goes, we should start a union. And I said, yeah, let's start a union. What's, what do we do? What do we call ourselves? Let's, let's call ourselves the Independent Jackhammer Workers Union. So the six of us walked up to the bank and we went into the bank and started a – because we thought we'd be official if we had a bank account. So we went into the, <laughs> the then St. George Bank and said, we'd like to open an account, please. And the lady said, yeah, sure, what do you want to call it? And we said, oh, we'll call it the Independent Jackhammer Workers Union. And she didn't bat an eyelid. She just wrote it down, gave us all the paperwork, and we all deposited really? – 10 bucks each and we had the account <laughs> we never put any money in it or took any money out of it and to my <laughs> knowledge somewhere in the ether there's probably still an independent jackhammer worker you can a little bit of interest <laughs> somewhere i mean the the bank doesn't even exist anymore the st george <laughs> bank so i don't know what happened to that 30 bucks but or 40 bucks whatever it was but anyway that that was difficult to sustain because there was not many jackhammer union projects so then shane rocks up with this idea that well let's get polo shirt so we got these blue polo shirts so we put the we got the embroidered initials J I J W U, uh the independent jackhammer workers union and we we colloquially referred to it as the ij triple u i don't know why that's w just, and u so oh, yeah. Triple oh yeah i see yeah that's probably yeah. where we got it from so anyway we got it we'd get up and we'd say i remember the first morning we did it we ran out of jackhammer jobs and so the three of us stood up through well three of us stood up the front of church in the morning service in front of the early morning service of the prayer book service the traditional service where everyone's everyone was over 60 and and so we got up and said oh have you got any kind of jobs around the yard that you want doing because we've we're here to tell you that the ij triple u can come around and do your garden for you and all these oldies were coming up to us after the service and say oh that's lovely and we're like well you got to sign up you can't just assume we're <laughs> going to come around to your house and, she, and these i remember one lady she was a widow she's like what do you mean you may not come around well you've got to apply like you can't just expect us to turn up you know like we have lanyards with ij triple u on them you know we're really official we're a union she thought it was hilarious so she's laughing along so she had to fill in a form which was basically just a handwritten form on a piece of paper and we went around to her house Gwen her name was Gwen Wiley and she's the loveliest lady anyway the next day oh yeah actually no it was the next Saturday 15 young blokes and a couple of young ladies came along to go and do a garden and we just got into it for like six hours and we pruned the trees and we mowed the lawn and never seen so many snail shells in all my life like it was just <laughs> unreal we're just sweeping everything and she just she she would come out and in this big booming voice said uh, morning tea like then we're all like, oh great tools down you know we're all tools down and we go and sit down and we, she had like all the nice little cups and saucers and the little you know beautiful little morning tea we'd have a morning tea and then we'd like and she'd say well don't hang around here all day you've got heaps to, to do work. get back to work so we're all back to work and we worked really hard anyway we all stood there and looked at it together at the afternoon and went that was really cool so news spread around and I kid you not probably for three or four years I'd have to ask Shane but I reckon three or four years the majority of us were working in somebody's yard almost every weekend and Gwen was the first one and so she always took precedent. So if Gwen needed her house doing, they all, you know, and when Gwen passed away, um, there was a number of IJ Triple U guys that, um, that were, yeah, really, really moved by that. And, um, yeah, I know that they wore their shirts that weekend to church, the, week, the weekend she passed away just to, in memory of her and stuff. And, um, yeah, I think the, the funny thing is that was just nothing that we just thought, let's have a bit of fun. But what actually became important is not only did we help Gwen and the others with their yards, but we just ended up becoming friends with Gwen. And those guys became really good friends and the girls became really good friends. And there was one young lady who was coming along who 
would actually go around Gwen's every Tuesday for a cup of tea just to spend the morning with her on Tuesdays every week because of that friendship that they made. So I, I think I think there's something deep down in, in our hearts that really wants to be connected with each other. Mm. And we have these funny stereotypes and cultural nuances that stop us getting together. And I think if we can name the goodness in coming together, then that's good. I mean, like Tim, I grew up with my grandparents they lived in our house and then my mum and dad live with us at grace point mm. and so i've had two well all those generations how many it is going you know my sons have grown up with their grandparents too i don't know if i'll get a call up we'll have to wait and see <laughs> but um maybe maybe not but but i think i think in general it's um yeah it's just really something that's not it doesn't cost anything to do so i'm sure that people can come up with different ideas. It'd be lovely to hear what people's ideas are who are listening to the podcast, actually. Yeah. I could but I often could think of Gwen. They were good days. Yeah, and that's a lovely story. Uh, I've got one final question. You mentioned last week, Stu, um, our brother Ian from our ride gathering. Mm. And he said um, he thinks that when people from different backgrounds hang out around Jesus, it brings glory to God. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to extend that question to people from different ages gathering around Jesus, does that bring glory yeah, to God? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, 100% think so, yeah. yeah. Tim, anything you want to add on that? No, I, I mean, I think absolutely it brings glory to God because, as I said, this is how God has made us to be. And so when we live in alignment with God's good design, then yes, it will bring glory to God. And what um, what's really lovely is when we notice that it doesn't just bring glory to God, but it's actually for our good as well. Yep. And so God is not arbitrary in the things that he asks us to do for his glory um there is actually you know benefit for humanity as well mm. and i think that's uh, I've, I've said it numbers of times on the podcast like that's that's what gives me a real buzz is when i see you know god's word and you know things in the social sciences like this um, documentary actually in alignment and it's like well of course people who are living in according to god's good design in terms of they have some sort of intergenerational relationships um uh, are seeing these physical benefits even mm. um and which is not a a promise um i don't think we can we can take it as a you know as long as you live with your great grandparents they will live till they're 99 <laughs> you know that, that's not you know no. ever promised anywhere and i don't and certainly the statistics wouldn't hold that up but there is there are great benefits with living in god according to god's good design primarily it brings glory to him it points people in his direction shows how beautiful he is and we actually see how much it blesses those who are following him as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good way to finish. But uh, hopefully, it can it be it can be we can be three centenarians <laughs> at some point because of the way that we hang out. Unless Jesus comes back, then Unless we're, we're hanging out as long yeah. as possible. Well, uh, what year do you become a hundred? Uh, that's hard. That's putting me on the spot. How old am I now? Thirty-six. You just think about your birthday, man. Oh, and at a hundred. Sorry. Yeah, that's that's probably that's a good way to way. do it. Yep. Twenty. 2,096. So I'll definitely be in heaven. glory? <laughs> <laughs> I will be. So no, you'll be living with your great grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what was it in, in... I'll be 2086. I'll be 100. 2086. All right. I'm going to make myself a note. Make a time capsule. You know, they used to do that. Buried oh, in the, in the ground at schools. I was thinking, if you do get to 100, we'll toast you from heaven, but maybe we'll all be in heaven by then. Yeah, we could be. And we could say, remember when we said... 2086. Yeah, no, like, no, Jesus came back before we then. We won't remember. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, thank you very much to these two future centenarians. We appreciate it, Tim. And thank you, Joel. Thanks very much. And I could be one. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Uh, you can email me any ideas or thoughts you have on centenarians, intergenerationality, ages, fri friendships, uh, and anything else. And uh, I like this idea, Stu, of we talked about networking last episode. Mm. That we can use come back to it next week yeah come back next week and also see how we can make that a way of forming yeah. friendships with I think, the older I think we'll have some more ideas by next week too I reckon okay that sounds more really things cool. we can share too anyway thank you also to producer Eck who puts all these podcasts mm. together and as always uh, we'll finish with a one way one way, one way.